Hello and welcome all to our horror cinema podcast. I'm Joe, here with me is my co-host Dan. Hello and greetings. Today we're discussing the Dracula Has Risen from the Grave movie. Now, as Christopher Lee once said, I think in a letter about this, this is such a horrid title. It is a horrible title, but it's such a good film. So unbelievably cheesy. And just dumb for a title name. But it it's such a great title. In this movie, the story starts off with Dracula dead and the local villagers still a little scared, afraid because last time a monk said, ah, oh, he's gone, forget about it. Dracula kind of came back, so they're kind of still a little nervous until a cardinal shows up, a Monsignor, as he's called, and basically browbeats them into acknowledging that Dracula is dead. He then ends up talking to the local priest and telling them, you know, man up a little, butch up a little young lady. However, that said, the... Trouble is, it's hard to argue with how, well, last time someone went to the castle, Dracula got revived. Can't we just avoid the castle and not deal with it? But the Monsignor wants to make a point. But there's something almost Judeo-Christian in a way about the journey up the mountain with the one priest failing part of the journey, part way through the journey because he's scared. And the priest just saying... Okay, fine. You can stay here. I'll continue going. So that's almost, um, it's a bit like, what was it? Peter fall and the apostles falling back as Jesus goes, you know, like along on the road with the Roman soldiers. It kind of reminded me of that. I'm not trying to be overly Christian. It's just, there's that. And I think some of the stories about the Buddha that it kind of reminded me of. It's just, it seemed very religious there. That said, the villagers have a good reason why they aren't keen on Drac. They found a rotting corpse of a young lady in the bell in the clock tower of the church, so that, that would be a little daunting. I wonder who had to clean up the rotting corpse out of there. Probably the priest, which I can understand why he'd be a little traumatized. So there's context to why he's traumatized. That said, he soon ends up accidentally reviving Drac, and falls under his spell so that he's the Renfield. Which, having a priest be the Renfield is a bit of an interesting twist. Dracula, meanwhile... Not Dracula. The, the Cardinal sticks a cross in the doorway, which enrages Dracula, who vows revenge. And they decide to follow him to Italy. It is in Italy that we are introduced to Paul, the main character of the movie. And this is the start of the Paul trilogy of Hammer Dracula films where each of the main characters will be called Paul. Now, as, Cine as the Cinemassacre's angry video game nerd James Rolfe once noted, Hammer seems to have had a Rolodex of three names, Hans, Carl, and Paul. They always use these names for main characters and whatnot. It's so weird. Anyways, keeps it simple, I guess. But at least they used different kind of character archetypes to an extent and characters than in each film and whatnot from each other. So Paul is a young baker or apprentice baker who is studying at the local university philosophy and, and whatnot. It's not clear exactly what he's studying, only that he loves learning. But on the other hand, his learning has caused him to become an atheist so that he quickly clashes with the cardinal. Honestly, it's hard to disagree with Paul in this scene because at the family dinner because the guy asked him for his opinion. He gave it honestly. And after the cardinal said, there's very few men on earth that are truly to their core honest. And I, I like that in a man. And Paul then says, all right, I'm an atheist. You deny the existence of the Lord? No, I just don't believe in him. Which sets off the cardinal who says, no, you're not good enough for my niece. And oh boy... That sets off a lot of drama. Meanwhile, at the tavern where Paul, the tavern slash bakery where Paul works at, the waitress Zena has a fan who's a promiscuous barmaid, 
has taken a fancy to him. That said, she ends up running into Dracula on her journey home and is soon semi... Well, she's drained and quickly roped into Dracula's side. But you can see that she's struggling with being on his side. At the same time that she's becoming jealous of Maria more than ever. And she's becoming possessive of Dracula. Who, not liking female possessiveness, gets angry at her, slaps her around a little, and forces her to help him with trying to capture Maria. Drac's scared off, thanks to Paul, and Maria ends up shaken but returning home with the priest realizing that Paul and Maria are seeing one another. That said, Xena's jealousy gets the better of her so that Dracula decides to finish her off, but because he does not want her to become a vampire, aka one of his brides, he has the priest throw her corpse into the fire. Now the priest, who was forced to dig up in a coffin of Dracula's defeated bride from the first movie, chucks out the body on the side of the road and whatnot. So we have this arc for the priest who's just being abused and falling further and further away from the way of faith. A bit like Paul in a way. So that when the cardinal, on his, for his part, realizes that Maria has been bitten by Dracula in her room, he tries to give chase one night after Dracula, only to be wounded by the priest, and he's incapable of protecting Maria's. So that you actually have Paul who's called in, and Paul calls in the priest to help him, thinking a man of faith might be helpful here, because, you know, it's a vampire they're dealing with. Paul ends up subdued by the priest, only to wake up, because the priest would have handed taken the cross off Maria's neck, but the sight of the cross and the realization of how far he's fallen renews his faith, because he has nothing left, and him and Paul team up, and vow to destroy Dracula. So they give chase after Maria is captured by Drac. And they decide to give chase after him, like I said, as far as Transylvania. So that they're imitating the latter part of the Dracula novel. Dracula has Maria throw over the cross, over the side of the mountain. Paul and Dracula fall off. And somehow, it's pretty thematic and also funny... Paul ends up grabbling on, grabbing onto a rose thorn, I think that it is, that on the, that's growing out of the side of the mountain, while Dracula falls on the cross. It is such a... I think we're supposed to read into it an act of God, but it, it, I don't think I like that part of the movie. No, seriously, it's, it's too much for me. That said, the priest then recites the sermon with Dracula destroyed by... His, this renewed sense of faith on the part of the priest and Paul. I guess I could... I don't mind them rediscovering their faith, but this seems a little heavy-handed. But I do like how at the end, Paul does the symbol of the cross, so that the entire thing is symbolic of his rediscovery of faith. So I do like that. There's a positive character arc there, but on the other hand, the way track falls on the cross, I don't know. And of course, the couple's kiss, farewell, and we get the credits. Now, Veronica Carlson plays Maria, the love interest, and this is her first Hammer movie, I think. She goes on to become a frequent Hammer babe, and she's one of the prettiest. Xena's actress was quite pretty, and sadly, she, I think, only played in this one movie. A shame. Paul's actor, I have, I didn't see him in any other Hammer movies, but maybe I need to see more of them. Maybe. Christopher Lee comes in, of course, playing Dracula. And, of course, every actor is on point. So, we're going to rate this movie. I'm going to say this movie's easily a three and a half. Three and three quarters. I think you're underrating this film. This film is darn near perfect. There's, exactly. It's not Brides of Dracula, but it's one of the best horror movies ever made. So, I think 3.1 is... Three and grossly. three and three quarters. Oh, I thought you had said three point one. I must have misheard. Good. 
But I mean, I I'm not the one underrating it. Ah, uh, but here's the thing. It's just... The heavy-handedness at the end? Yeah, there's that. And it's not Brides of Dracula. It's not directed by Terry Fisher. In some ways, you can see these problems in the film. And the decor is perfect in the film. But the problem is, I find that too much time is spent on the college nonsense. And that the... I, I kind of wish the baker had a bit more of a role tied in with Paul at the end and team up with them. Because he just fades out of the movie at the end. And I don't like that. Pull through or kill him off as he tries to help the gang. As a nod to Quincy in the novel, I mean. So these are the problems I have with the movie. But that said, the product we got was darn near perfect. And the actor for the baker was really good. I mean, he comes she... back in a few other ro quite a few other roles in Hammer films yes i was going to note that because his roles in the the frankenstein uh, movies are really good and in later dracula movies he's good in other hammer movies he became a frequent hammer star and i think he kind of became a horror icon in his own right i think i can't remember but darn near perfect actor he passed away a while back him peter cushing uh, such a shame such icons. Thankfully, we still have horror icons like Veronica Carlson, I think, and others of the Hammer babes of Hammer. And all of them were great actresses, for the most part. For the most part. And don't forget to smash that like and that subscribe button to stay tuned.